muted in a two. Yeah, but now is my voice clear? Great. So, uh, so before uh, diving into these three area, we'll quickly review some uh, fundamental of the diffusion model. Since this is not a tutorial, sorry, on the diffusion models, we'll, we will keep this part uh, very brief. So the goal is to ensure that even you don't have a strong background on the diffusion models, you, you will still be able to understand uh, the rest of content related to uh, video generation and editing. So let's first talk about the uh, fundamentals of the diffusion model. So you uh, probably heard of the DDA, DDPM, uh, which is denoising diffusion probabilistic models. And it's one of the most uh, well-known type of the diffusion model out here. So uh, the process involves two main stages, the forward uh, process and the reverse process. So the forward process is essentially the diff diffusion part where we uh, gradually add noise to an image. And uh, uh, you can see from this uh, diagram that uh, we start with a clean image. And as we move forward, we keep adding more noise until image becomes uh, com completely noise. Then uh, we have the reverse process, which is the denoising process. Uh, here we slowly remove the noise step by step to uh, recover the original image. So uh, the reverse process is what gives it the name uh, denoising. So this e equation essentially combines a portion of the uh, original image with uh, some noise. So early on, the image remains mostly clear, but with the T increases, the influence of the noise grows, making the image more and more distorted. So now uh, for transi uh, transitioning from one step, uh, time step to the next, uh, we use the equation here. And uh, in simpler terms, this tells us that the image at time step t, uh, xt is uh, normally distribution around a noise version of the image at the previous step. Uh, xt minus one, the noise, noise strength at each time step is given by the beta t. And uh, the researchers have found a way to define the, the amount of noise that is added to an image at each time step using uh, this equation. So what is fascinating is that uh, with some mathematic work, we can actually jump directly from the original image x0 to any later noise image xt using uh, this equation. So let's talk about the reverse process. The idea here is to remove the noise from the image. So how do we achieve that? Uh, we define and uh, train a neural network that is specifically designed to identify and eliminate noise from the image. So this network learns to denoise the image effectively reversing the diffusion process and uh, restoring original content. So to understand the denoising process more precisely, uh, let's take a look at this diagram. Uh, during our training process, we start with a noise image uh, denoted as XT, which is a combination of original image XT, X0 and the sound noise. So our goal is to fully recover the original image. Uh, the critical task uh, for the noise predictor network here, which is the denoise, is to accurately predict the noise uh, present in XT. So once the noise is 
predicted. We subtracted from the xt as indicated by the uh, subtraction equation. And uh, this subtraction helps us to retrieve the original image x0. And one important aspect to note is that the noise predictor takes into account several conditions. For, for instance, we can uh, it, it consider the time safe T, which controls the amount of noise to the to be removed. And uh, because we are dealing with uh, more complex tasks like conditional generation with text from the next the uh, network is uh, provided with a specific condition or descriptions uh, such as the text input and uh, for example, uh, the text input might be a cat guiding the network to recover the image of a cat. So, uh, but usually we don't achieve this in a single state. Instead, we proceed step by step. This might seem a little bit uh, counterintuitive at first, but it helps to understand that the denoising process is not perfect and can introduce some errors. So to reduce these uh, errors, we iteratively add small amount of noise and then remove it again uh, in the subsequent steps. This gradual approach allows us to uh, refine the image incrementally, moving closer to the, the original images. And in practice, this process is, uh, typically requires a, a few hundred steps to generate a single image. As you can uh, imagine, this is not very ideal as it can be quite time consuming. So uh, the question is, can we speed up this process? And essentially, uh, can we reduce the number of steps involved in the noise prediction process? Yeah, of course, uh, we can. And in practice, this process typically, re sorry. Yeah, this. So of course, this brings us uh, to uh, another well-known diffusion model called DDIM, denoising diffusion impl implicit models. So the idea behind this uh, DDIM is that uh, we don't randomly sample the noise during generation process. Instead, we directly use the noise predicted by the uh, predictor network. So here is how it works. We first uh, extract, uh, subtract the predicted noise for in a specific equation, and then we can add this noise back in. Uh, so by using this approach, DDIM aims to streamline the process and make it more efficient. So when comparing these two different models and uh, their sampling process, so we can see the distinct difference. The DDPM requires a, like more steps to generate an image, and uh, but DDIM is more efficient and can skip some time step, time steps, and uh, uh, requires, for example, only around fifty steps to generate a reasonably good image. And uh, also. Uh, we introduced the, the, the DDIM inversion. So the inversion is not a, a new concept to the diffusion model. So uh, it's also used in the GANs uh, generative adversarial networks. So the typically uh, typical inference or generation process involves taking a noise input, uh, passing through a denoiser to remove the noise. And the inversion uh, essentially is the reverse process. So given an original image and a trend denoise, we aim to determine the, the initial noise that uh, produced the given image. In other words, during the prediction process, we uh, work backwards to find out what the input noise was. Uh, that lead to the final image. 
And uh, you might notice that the uh, in the DDM uh, the inversion process in the DDM is somewhat similar to the forward uh, process. So uh, in the forward process at, at each time step T, we add random noise. However, in the DDM inversion process, the noise is not randomly sampled each time. And instead, at each time step, we invert noise. We determine uh, this inverted noise from the noise predicted by DDIM at the specific time step. So uh, here's a quick overview of DDPM or DDIM. So if you, you want to learn more about these fundamentals, uh, I highly recommend watching this uh, CVPR tutorials on diffusion models and uh, uh, this and excellent work they could uh, provide a comprehensive explanations uh, along with other valuable materials you can find online. And uh, also a high helpful suggestion is to try to implement uh, this concept yourself after going to, through this uh, tutorial or reading the materials. So uh, as mentioned earlier, the text uh, description can be used as a uh, condition serving as input for a uh, noise predictor. But how are we gonna use uh, this text as condition? So uh, here the OpenAI has uh, developed a technique called CLIP. So essentially this model focus on the uh, image text matching. So, uh, Clip has an image encoder to extract, extract the features from image and the text encoder to extract the feature from the text description. So the, so the goal is uh, to match this feature. So an image and a uh, text pair corresponding to some uh, content, their simil uh, similarity score will be high. So for conditional generation task, we can use the text encoder to uh, extract the features from text description. And uh, these features can then be fed into the denoiser uh, in the image generation process. So this allows the image generator to be conditioned on the text uh, description. And another interesting uh, part is so-called latent diffusion. So we been discussing the uh, denoising in the pixel space but, uh, where the noise is added and uh, removed directly from the original image. However, sometimes we want the process to be more efficient. So this uh, is where the idea of uh, latent space comes in. So uh, in latent diffusion, we use the uh, encoder and the decoder to extract high, uh, high level latent representations or embedding from the image. And uh, these are essentially feature map in high level uh, semantic space. So the diffusion process occurs in the uh, small latent space. This uh, uh, gives more efficiency in, uh, efficiencies in uh, dealing with the diffusion process. So here is the diagram as outlined in the uh, stable diffusion or uh, latent diffusion paper. So given the uh, input image X, we uh, encode it into a latent space and uh, uh, perform the denoise process in the latent space. And uh, uh, we use the decoder to transfer uh, the latent representation to back to the original pixel space. And uh, we can have we can we can apply uh, a lot of conditions to the stable diffusion. For example, the text input and also uh, such as image input or semantic max. And uh, here are some examples of image generated by stable diffusion. Uh, so the results are quite impressive, and the uh, quality has significantly improved over the past few years. Uh, so the latest version, such as uh, Stable Diffusion 3, can generate very high resolution and high quality images. 
And uh, another technology is called LoRAS, uh, which stands for Low Rank Adaptation. So this was uh, original proposed for the efficient fine tuning. And, uh, but this method is quite gen generic and uh, not limited to the uh, language model or diffusion model. So the key idea is that uh, if we want to generate a image from uh, uh, in a specific domain, such as the cartoon image, so different users have uh, different uh, domain specific data and want to fine tune the uh, original diffusion model to suit their needs. So LoRa allows uh, this kind of efficient customization and uh, uh, the method has been quite popular with the community uh, because the user can train their own LoRa and share them with others. And uh, also the dream booth is for the uh, image customization. Uh, similar to LoRa's, uh, the dream booth fine-tuned the diffusion model, but uh, instead of fixing entire base model, it fine-tunes the model using specific uh, additional unit. So uh, for instance, this uh, dream booth can uh, fine-tune the diffusion model to make it capable of accurately generating some specific concept like a specific cat or dog, which is not exist in the uh, token space of original diffusion model. And uh, also the control net is uh, a very notable technology in the image generation field and uh, also being used in the video generation. So it can uh, precisely, uh, it pre provide precise uh, user control over the generated images. So uh, for example, user can provide an edge map or the generated image will align with the uh, contour of the edge map. Also the pose. And uh, the control line is designed to uh, by making a copy of the original stable diffusion model and then uh, modifying only the copy part. So the copy part includes uh, additional conditions such as edge map or human pose map as input. So the output from this uh, modified part are then fused with the output of original stable diffusion. So this allows control net to handle a variety of conditions like sketch, depth, and more. So uh, here are some basic concepts that we might use in the following uh, presentation. So let's get into the main part of the video generation. So the diagram we have been seeing so far might be uh, incomplete due to the short timeline. And uh, we might have missed uh, a few details. However, there are quite a few foundation models or base models for the uh, diffusion-based video generation. So we've categorized these models uh, and uh, related works into seven categories. The first three categories uh, focus on foundation models or base models. And then we will introduce other related topics in this field. So let's start with some uh, pioneer work in this field. For example, the video diffusion model and other works like uh, image and video from Google and uh, Align Your Lighting from NVIDIA and uh, make a video from Meta. So the T2I task, uh, it is to generate an image from a text distribution. And for video generation, the task is called T2V, which is text to video, where we generate a video from the uh, text description. And uh, the difference between the T2I and the T2V is that for T2I, we generate 2D images, but for T2B will generate 3D contents, which uh, essentially means a sequence of 2D images, like for example, uh, 16 frames of videos. 
So uh, handling this, uh, so for handling this transition from 2D image generation to 3D video, uh, actually it's a new challenge in the diffusion model field, but uh, for the video understanding field, this is now a, a very new problem. So uh, for example, researchers have been uh, addressing similar issues for several years, particularly in the area, for example, like action reco recognition. So uh, previously models were uh, developed for image recognition and then focus shift uh, to the uh, recognition actions uh, in the videos. So back in uh, ICCB 2015, so researchers uh, developed a technique called 3D convolution layers. So the idea is similar to 2D convolution, but uh, extended uh, additional dimension along the uh, time uh, domain. So however, researchers uh, later aim to improve the efficient of, efficiency of the 3D convolution. Uh, for example, use a 2D, 2 plus 1D convolution and for specific uh, layers, the process is factorized into a 2D spatial convolution and followed by a 1D temporal convolution. So now, uh, Let's introduce the very first video diffusion models from Google. Uh, for, for example, they have uh, introduced a model that is capable of generating this uh, like 16 frame videos out of the thin air. And this was a significant milestone in this field, uh, demonstrating the potential ability of diffusion model for the video generation. So uh, what I did is actually quite simple and straightforward. So essentially they extend the 2D diffusion model to 3D by using a factorization approach uh, over the space and time. So however, instead of using a two plus one D convolution, they use uh, what is known as a spatial space only convolution. So this means that they apply a perfect model uh, extending 2D convolution into 3D by adding one more dimension, but with the kernel size around the, this dimension set to one. And uh, uh, so to uh, this layer, this layer is performed uh, also have the uh, spatial and uh, cross attention operations that uh, only along the temporal uh, dimension. So essentially for each pixel, the temporal attention they are consider how the uh, pixel changes over time and uh, perform the uh, attention operation across the 16 frames. This allowed the model to capture the temporal dynamic uh, necessary for generating uh, coherent videos. So let's uh, look deeper into how to build a video diffusion model using the Meta's Make a Video as an example. So this model employs a more commonly used uh, diagram nowadays, which is a, a cascade process. So video generation is complex. So instead of generate a video in a single state, it's uh, better to break it down into multiple stages. And uh, make a video follow four stage process. So uh, the first one is spatial temporal decoder, uh, starting with the noise, the stage uh, decodes or generates the keyframes at uh, a very small, a small resolution with a limited number of frames. So these keyframes are the foundation of the video and also frame interpolation. So to increase the duration and uh, also the number of the frames, 
this stage uh, takes the generated keyframes and uh, interprets additional frames between them. And uh, the third one is spatial temporal superregion. So at this stage, the temporal and the uh, spatial resolution are enhanced and uh, this improves the visual quality and also resolution and duration of the frames generated in previous stage. And also the spatial uh, super resolution at the final stage to further increase the video quality. So here is a more specific example of how we uh, generate a uh, high resolution by uh, stages. So for example, taking a uh, text as input and uh, uh, it encodes into a, a clip embedding, for example, and uh, this gives to uh, spatial temporal decoder and uh, generate a very low resolution and uh, low duration videos. And uh, further, it has been uh, upsampled temporally and also spatially. So let's look into more details. The make a video models follow the two plus one D uh flag paradigm for these uh convolutional layers. So it starts with the 2D convolution that operates on the spatial uh dimensions and followed by 1D temporal convolution. And uh, also another important operation in the diffusion model is the attention. So for spatial attention, it remains the same as the uh, text to image model using the same uh, pre-chain ways. So given the input uh, data where spatial dimension are, uh, for example, represented as H by uh, W and the temporal dimension T, we apply self-attention or other uh, attention mechanism at each time step. So in detail, the spatial attention is applied uh, within each frame independently and focus on spatial dimension of the image. And uh, the temporal attention is focused on learning the dynamic across the time. And uh, so this process is uh, repeated for each spatial position and uh, ensure that model can capture the uh, spatial and temporal dynamics uh, effectively. So let's talk more specifically about the uh, training process. There are four stages, uh, sorry, these four uh, main stages in uh, the, uh, in the makeup video actually are uh, uh, initialized, initially chained on the image data to provide a solid initialization. So after the initial chaining, we, uh, they insert the temporal layers. So the, uh, including the temporal convolution and uh, also the temporal self-attention. So these layers are further fine-tuned uh, on the video data. So the make a video model is a channel, uh, 10 million videos from the WV data set and also 10 million subset from uh, HDV, 100 million data set. So uh, the web video data set as introduced by the uh, video to text paper consists of the video caption uh, pairs. So these videos are typically high quality and comes with the uh, accompany text uh, description. So the combination of the video and the text data is essential for the uh, training model to generate in videos based on the text prompt. So the make video uh, use several metrics to evaluate uh, its performance. Uh, for example, the FID to measure the quality of generated video. And uh, uh, so compared to previous model, uh, the make video shows better performance on, on these metrics 
and uh, oh really so yeah i just keep oh so uh yeah it works and uh uh also evaluates the cross -similar similarity between the generated video and uh, their corresponding uh text description using a clip model and here are more comparison with uh other methods and uh uh, make a video uh, is actually performed uh, quite well in the uh, video generated generation task. And uh, also they did the human evaluation uh, to compare with other models. And here are some examples of the videos they generated. And uh, uh, actually it was quite interesting still now. And uh, one very impressive feature of the Maker video is the is interpretation modules. So if you have like two images and the model can generate the uh, intermediate frames. So this uh, an overview of the Maker video from uh, the Meta as a, uh, as an example of. Uh, what a video diffusion model pipeline should be like. So uh, there are also other uh, diffusion models uh, developed by uh, companies. For example, uh, Google has uh, its own video diffusion model called Imager Video, which uh, is actually developed uh, based on the image. Imagen is the uh, text to image foundation models. So uh, very like the, the uh, make a video. So they also adopt a, like a cascade generation pipeline. And also the alliance you Latin from the NVIDIA. So uh, the one key difference uh, from the Google or Meta's approach is that the NVIDIA's model builds up on the stable diffusion models. So this idea here is to leverage the latent diffusion model, uh, which is operated in the latent space rather than directly in the pixel space to make the process more efficient. And uh, they do a lot of, they do some changes uh, uh, to, uh, leverage the pre-trained text to image model for the video generation. For example, uh, this is how they insert temporal layers by uh, inserting temporal convolution and also the 3D attention layers. And uh, they also have a, a specific design decoder that has uh, 3D convolutions to uh, preserve the temporal consistency. And uh, also they have uh, up sample layer that has the 3D convolution there inside. So uh, let's, uh, so for the model we introduced so far, actually developed by the major companies like Google, Meta, and uh, also NVIDIA, is extra. So however, the uh, limitation is that these models are not open source, which uh, kind of restrain their uses in the, uh, by the broader uh, research community. So uh, that's why many of us are working on developing uh, our own foundation model and make them open source for everyone to use. So this way, the research community can benefit and also build up on these models. So there is a significant amount of uh, design of work in the open source domain as well. For example, uh, the Lavi uh, video crafter and uh, show one and also the uh, stable video diffusion. So let's start uh, with the 
uh, model score for T2V, which then uh, for the T2V stands for the text to uh, video. So the idea uh, is quite similar to the, the cross source work we have introduced. Uh, they begin with a pre trained image model. And uh, for video generation, they use this uh, pre trained text to image and uh, uh, adapt it for the video uh, modeling. So this approach involves the inflating the stable diffusion model to 3D uh, while uh, preserved the its pre trained weight. So it inserts the spatial temporal block. Uh, it essentially uh, following a 2D plus 1D frame uh, pipeline. This means that uh, using 2D convolutions in the spatial dimension and the 1D convolution in the temporal. And uh, one interesting aspect of this work is the, its ability to handle various number of frames. So this pos this is quite this is possible because. Uh, both the temporal convolution and the attention layers are designed to be uh, variable in this. So the benefit of this variable lens is that it can be set to one in some case. So uh, when the temporal lens is set to one, the model effectively reduced uh, to a image generation models. So this allowed the model to be trained on both images and videos. So uh, in this table, they compare uh, their performance with uh, many cross source models we have mentioned and the result is quite good. And, uh, but uh, one issue with the model score model is that uh, it will show some uh, watermarks in the generated video, which uh, originate from the uh, wave video data set for which is used for the training. So the wave video uh, data set often have uh, like the short stock uh, watermark, which is quite annoying. So uh, to uh, resolve this problem, the zero scope and another open source work uh, further fine tune uh, the model score model on a smaller but higher quality data set. So it can remove the watermarks and uh, uh, produce clear outputs. So here are some uh, comparison between uh, the model score model and uh, make a video models. And uh, more example here. So the model scope or the zero scope are very good open source model, but one issue we have noticed is that the uh, text alignment, which I mean, uh, video and the text uh, correspondence is not perfect. So sometimes the generated video does not accurately reflect the content uh, described by the text. For example, here, uh, a text form that a panda by the waterfall uh, holding a sign that says show one, uh, the output of the zero score or model score failed to uh, include the signs, even uh, like commercial model like Gen2 struggling with this. So the idea is that we uh, examine why models like model scope uh, struggle to generate content that precisely align with the text. Uh, so while models like uh, image and video can generate very uh, accurate content. So the key difference I think with uh, the diffusion model in operate in the pixel space or the, in the Latin space. So we found that in the pixel space, the model interacts directly with the image pixels, so allow better control over the generated content. So the comparison uh, here assess different pixel and Latin model combination at varying uh, resolutions. So uh, the key idea here is that 
the uh, pixel-based model, as we mentioned, is uh, good at the uh, text uh, and vi video alignment, but it will uh, cost a lot of memory because it operates directly on the pixel images space. Uh, but in the latent space, uh, like uh, for the low resolution video generation, we found the uh, the text alignment is not good. So, uh, so the idea is that the uh, we combined these two kinds of model and uh, uh, by marrying a pixel model with a uh, latent uh, diffusion models. So here is uh, what we have introduced in the show one. Like we use a pixel uh, based video diffusion model uh, for a low resolution image uh, video generation. And uh, we further use a latent based video diffusion model to upsample the uh, generated low resolution videos. So uh, in the in this uh, keyframe generation and the frame interpolation and super resolution, the we use pixel diffusion model because they work at a low resolution where uh, mem memory usage is manageable. But for the final super resolution, using a pixel uh, based model will lead to uh, out of memory problems. So. Uh, we switch to the latent based diffusion model. So this hybrid approach combines the strengths of both pixel and latent model to achieve high quality video generation. And uh, there are also other works that uh, was mentioning, for example, the Tencent's video crafter model. So similar to previous approach in inverse inserting the temporal layer, uh, to the latent diffusion model to handle video generation effectively. So uh, we also have the model like the LAVI from the NTU, uh, which focus on joint uh, video generation. So notably, they develop a new data set for training. And uh, this data set consists of the, around uh, 25 million high quality video text pair. And uh, with this higher quality data set, the LAVI model achieve better performance and generates higher quality videos. So here are some example videos generated by uh, LAVI. And you can see that the quality and resolution are actually significantly better. And uh, notably, Stability AI just released uh, stable video diffusion diffusion or SVDs. So it follows a similar direction as the LAVI by creating a better training data set and focus on the uh, data processing and uh, also annotation. So they implemented several steps such as uh, cut de detection and uh, also the clipping to ensure the uh, text description correspond precisely to a, a single shot. And uh, also they use the uh, some automatic methods to generate these captions, including, uh, for example, like models like Bleep. Uh, they also compute various similarities and other metrics to enhance the data set. So two notable techniques uh, like they have been used is like the static scene filtering and also text OCR detection. So the static scene filtering involves the computing the optical flow uh, to fill out videos with uh, little or no significant motion. So this address the issues when generated video lags uh, large motions. And uh, the text OCR removes the clip that contains uh, a lot of text, but actually it depends on the uh, necessary, if the, this kind of text video is 
necessary for your application. So you might choose to keep these clips in your data set if you want a new model to generate text. And uh, they have uh, collected a very large data set called LVD. So uh, large video data set, they contain uh, like 500 million video clips uh, with a total duration of more than uh, 200 years. And uh, they also create a subset of this data set called LVD 10 million, and uh, which contains uh, 10 million video clips and has a total duration of about three years. So this is comparable with the VV data set, which contain also uh, 10 million clips. So after applying the filtering mentioned, uh, filtering process mentioned earlier, so we refined the LVD to a smaller high quality subset, uh, which only contains uh, 2 million clips. So this means that uh, about 25% of the original uh, LVD terminal data set was uh, retained after filtering, filtering. So by filtering low quality uh, videos, they significantly improve the uh, training efficiency. And the training process for the stable video diffusion models involves several stages. So as uh, you might expect, it follows a similar pattern to the paper we discussed uh, earlier. And uh, first, they start with image models, and specifically, they in initialize the model with uh, SD2, which is stable video, a uh, stable diffusion 2.1, and uh, they inflate the 2D models to a 3D to handle video. And uh, after this inflation, they change the model on uh, LVD data set uh, we mentioned earlier. And uh, uh, this is for the massive pre-training stage. And the final stage involves the high quality fine tuning. So similar, uh, very similarly to uh, how model scope, how zero scope was uh, fine tuned. Uh, by uh, starting from the model score models. So they fine tune the preacher model on a smaller but higher quality video data sets. And uh, here are some examples of the video generated by uh, SVD model. And as you can see, the, the quality is quite impressive. And uh, there are some still uh, other foundation model or base models, but they are uh, also cross uh, source. So uh, one of the model I would like to introduce is called uh, Lumia. So this is a model by the uh, Google people. And uh, so, uh, as we know, one of the key challenges in the video generation is to maintain the high quality temporal consistency. So especially uh, when we generate like uh, distant key frames uh, first and using uh, temporal super resolution for the interpolation. But uh, Lumia uh, tackled this problem with a new uh, approach. So instead of uh, relying on the temporal super resolutions, the Lumia adopts a space uh, space time unit, which is called STU net, and uh, this architecture actually generates the entire uh, temporal span uh, span of the video in a single pass. So which uh, kind of uh, enhance the temporal consistency. And uh, here is how it works. The uh, STU net does sample the video in both time and the space dimension. And uh, so this create a compact uh, time space Latin, uh, Latin space. So this approach allows uh, for the intensive computation to occur within the 
uh, compact space, making the process more effective and uh, computationally feasible. And uh, by processing the entire video duration at once, the STU net eliminates the dependency of the uh, temporal super resolution. So this ensures the smoother and also more coherent video generation. And STU net takes a pre-chain uh, text to image unit and uh, inflates it to handle the video. Uh, this enables uh, it to then sample and up sample across both time uh, and the space dimensions. So here is a breakdown of its component. So the convolution based block, uh, this block consists of the original uh, pre chain text to image layers. So we have they enhance this layer with a factorized. Uh, space-time convolution. This allows the model to effectively catch, capture the both uh, spatial and temporal information from the video. And uh, they also introduced the attention-based uh, blocks. So at the cost level of the unit, they incorporate the attention-based blocks. So this start with the pre chain text to image uh, layers that apply temporal attention mechanisms and helps the model focus on important temporal features across the entire video sequence. And uh, it's important to note that uh, further chaining is only applied on the newly added layers, so which is uh, significantly reduce the computational load and uh, the training time. And also a famous uh, line of work recently is uh, so-called uh, transformer-based video diffusion models, uh, DIT. And uh, the DIT model takes, uh, the DIT model uh, actually uh, models uh, the diffusion process using a transformer architecture. So it first petrifies the uh, encoded latent to a uh to to two tokens and uh, then uh input them to the transformer blocks so one thing is that one thing is uh notably mentioned is that the uh DIT model shows a uh, very good property of the scale uh scaling probabilities like uh, with the increase of the model size, the model gets better. So this is quite similar to the uh, the scaling law in the language part and uh, shows the promising uh, direction of the uh, scaling up the models. And uh, uh, also another uh, transformer. So the DIT is for the image and uh, there are foreign works that uh, extend the DIT models to the video generation. Uh, one of them is the Gentro. So in the Gentro paper, they actually observe the problems in the uh, text to video uh, quality. So one is that uh, the one is from the data part. So right now the video data is actually quite uh, limited in terms of the scale uh, compared to the image data sets. And uh, also uh, the quality of the video uh, are actually quite diverse. For example, they have some kinds of motion blur or watermarks, so which uh, will degrade their overall quality. And uh, also for the model training path that it uh, the problem is that if we opt optimize uh, specifically for the temporal aspect during the uh, video final training, uh, this will actually uh, degrade the spatial visual qualities. So this lead to the drop of the overall quality in the generated video. So two, uh, they provide solutions to 
uh, enhance the T2V quality in terms of the above mentioned aspects. So one is the joint uh, image video training. So this mitigate the shortage of the high quality video data and also uh, reduce the domain discrepancy between the two uh, imagery and uh, video models. And also they propose the motion uh, free guidance, which is quite similar to the uh, classifier free guidance uh, in the T2I or T2V task. So this uh, MFG modules, uh, they take the weight of the uh, motion information in the generated video so as to uh, improve the temporal consistency without hurting the spatial quality. So uh, in another research, uh, which, which is uh, what uh, by the Google, uh, so in this uh, in this paper, they actually encode both images and the video into a shared light and space. So this shared light and space allows uh, seamlessly processing uh, by the by a transform transformer blocks. So this uh, backbone employs the more uh, the block with. Uh, two layers of window restricted uh, attention. So the first layer focus on the uh, so the first layer here uh, focus on the spatial relations, especially capturing the details within both image and the video frames. And uh, the second layer designed for the spatial temporal dynamics. So these models, the temporal change in uh, the video while allowing the images to pass through via an uh, identity attention mask. And then they also use uh, cross attention to uh, for the text conditioning. So here are some results of uh, what model uh, generated by what models. So you can see that the motion is uh, actually more natural than uh, previous method we have seen. And uh, also uh, the snap video is also a recent uh, transformer based video diffusion models. So the snap video tackles the uh, problem to make, uh, how to make the uh, video generative model more efficient and also more scalable. So uh, for the unit-based model, which uh, currently is widely adopted for the, uh, in the video diffusion mod model uh, part, because uh, actually right now, a lot of models are actually based on the uh, widely known stable diffusion. Uh, but uh, it comes with the uh, computational overhead uh, compared to the text to image model. And uh, this overhead is actually a, a very significant bottlenecks. So this limits the scalability of the uh, unit based models. And uh, additionally, uh, extend unit architecture to handle both spatial and temporal. So requires a lot of attention operations. So which is also computationally intensive and uh, impractical. So uh, they come up with uh, like a normal solution. So they propose to leverage the redundant information between the friends and uh, they introduce a scalable uh, transformer architecture. So this architecture uh, treats the spatial and uh, also temporal dimension as a uh, single compressed 1D factors. By using these uh, highly compressed representations, so they can perform spatial temporal uh, computational in a joint manner. So this enables to 
uh, model much more uh, complex motions. So here are some comparison with the baseline models and it can be seen that uh, the baseline model actually has some kinds of uh, motion artifacts and uh, uh, where the snap video can uh, reduce it, this effectively. And also the SORA model, uh, which we have uh, mentioned, is actually a transformer-based uh, video diffusion model. So uh, they follow a similar pipeline of uh, using a visual encoder to encode both imagery and uh, uh, videos. So uh, the visual input is uh, represented as a sequence of the space-time patches, uh, so which as which as the transformer input tokens. So yes, the results uh, generated by the Sora model. Uh, I believe most of you have actually seen this uh, before. So, uh, so in the Sora paper, they actually find a, a very interesting insight is that uh, they found the diffusion transformer actually uh, uh, quite uh, scalable, can uh, just like language models, they can be scaled effectively uh, as well. So they show a comparison of the uh, video samples uh, with a fixed seed and uh, input as training progress. So the sampling uh, qualities actually improves uh, remarkably as the training compute increases. Well, Sora is uh, quite impressive, but it actually uh, has still has room for improvement. So uh, in my struggle to simulate the physics of, uh, for example, complexity like uh, this digging a trap from a hole, something like that. So the, the model might also confuse uh, spatial details included in the uh, text form, uh, such as uh, from left to right also. Uh, and also specific camera uh, trajectory as mentioned in their report. And uh, also the video point is also quite a female, uh, famous one, but it's, it's not a uh, diffusion-based video generative model. Uh, instead, it uh, models like uh, language models, which uh, is doing the next token predictions. So they have a video tokenizer called MacVid V2. And also they can take audio as input uh, and uh, convert this in, uh, input, different input domain to, uh, to the token space. And uh, they model this input uh, as uh, the, to predict the next tokens. And uh, they can handle this uh, different modality uh, in a single uh, and uh, unified models. And also other works like uh, Piaco, Latency, Video Factory, and Video Fusion. These are actually uh, notable works in this field. So, uh, so far we have uh, been discussing the foundation model, so which requires a lot of resources for training. And uh, these extensive training efforts are actually uh, typic uh, typically undertaken by a, a few groups or the companies. So uh, naturally there's a lot of uh, interest in making the training process more efficient. So uh, now let's introduce uh, some training efficient technology. So the first technology is, uh, I'd like to mention is called Animative. So uh, 
a law is called uh, training efficient. It still uh, requires training on large scale data set like uh, video and uh, with like 10 million clips. So this means that uh, it demands the uh, significant resources for the training. However, it's uh, efficient in some sense that it can be widely shared uh, and used by different users in the community. So as mentioned previously, the tech, uh, technologies like LoRa or Dreamboost uh, was to adapt the text to the imaging models for specific domains. So such as generating cartoon uh, style images. So if we want to uh, generate the image for a specific domain, can we, uh, do we need to change a video model specifically customized uh, for each T2I model? So previously uh, when training video diffusion models, we always study with a, a text to image model as initialization. So uh, the question is that the if the base T2I model has been customized for a specific no name. So do we need to redo the retire video training again? Uh, I don't ideally know. So the goal is to have a general video module that can be used uh, with various customized text to image model without uh, needing retrain the uh, video model for a specific do domain. So uh, they propose uh, an architecture that includes the motion module and motion layer to handle the video generation. And uh, this process is similar to uh, the one we mentioned that uh, adapting from 2D to 3D and uh, by adding these motion components. So, when using a like a model like stable diffusion, they only need to train the motion modules and the layer while uh, keeping the base T2I model frozen. And essentially the blue, uh, the blue part here represent the motion modules, which are trained separately. So once these modules are trained, they can be inserted or plugged into, into any image models architectures. So this approach works uh, quite well, and uh, this allows the creation of videos uh, from various customized T2I model, as long well as they are based on uh, uh, the same uh, pre-trained model. So uh, this design of uh, the motion module, uh, actually uh, includes the projection layer and uh, also the self-attention layers in the middle. So the in the training process, they only train the motion, motion module using the uh, VB data set we mentioned with uh, 10 million clips. And uh, the notable advantage in is that they train at a resolution of 256 by 256. So, uh, but the model can generalize well with higher resolution. This can save uh, computational resources during the training. And here are some results uh, of the animative. And uh, a lot of animative is uh, fascinated. So it's, uh, it's quite fantastic, but uh, it requires the still requires the model training, uh, specifically on the web video, on the uh, like 10 million uh, clips. So a more research or oriented question is that, can we transfer the uh, stable diffusion model into a video generation model without any additional training or uh, by training. Actually, there is a work called Text to Video Zero. Uh, actually, uh, this approach, uh, they start with the noise that has a similar pattern. 
So for the first frame, they can still randomly sample uh, noise, but for subsequent frames, uh, they define a global scene motion. For example, consider uh, generating video of a horse moving from uh, to the left uh, after randomly sampling the noise for the first frame. They create noise for the rest of the friends by uh, translating the initial noise uh, slightly to the left each time. So this translation adds the motion to the noise, but uh, it re retains very similar patterns across friends. So as a result, the generated images of uh, all the videos maintain consistency. And the second part involves that making the intermediate feature of different uh, friends very to be close. And uh, in this paper, they achieve this by modifying the self-attention layer. Specifically, when perform performing self-attention, they always use the key and value from the first friend uh, for all subsequent friends. So this ensures that the attention mechanism maintains consistency across friends. So another uh, optional operation involves making background more consistent by uh, applying smoothing techniques. So the idea is to generate or extract a mask of the main object. Uh, as the task of the video generation in this paper focus on uh, creating object-centric videos. Once the mask of the central object is generated, the, the background can be separated and uh, smooth. So this uh, helps maintain uh, consistent background throughout the video, enhancing the overall quality. And here are some results from the uh, text to video zero model. And as you can see, the the result actually is quite impressive given they are not uh, required any additional trainings. So they have the, the ability to uh, generate videos without further training, but uh, the content can be consistent. And also other some uh, works focus on uh, developing efficient training te uh, technologies such as magic video and simple diffusion adapter, etc. And uh, yeah, so far we have seen a few ex exciting videos generated by these uh, diffusion models. However, they are typically only a few seconds long and often feature a sing single and simple object in the, in the center of the frame. So can we generate longer videos, uh, perhaps like several millions in length? And can we create more complex video like those uh, at the movie level uh, with multiple subjects? So here we introduce a topic called Storyboard. So they are uh, already quite a few work uh, along these lines. So what is a storyboard and essentially the idea is to visualize a scene based on the text. For example, if I told you the scene that two men stand in an airport room and uh, uh, stare at the airplane through windows. So uh, what comes to your mind? So you probably can uh, imagine that a rough image of the scene described by this sentence. As humans, uh, we have the ability to envision the generated, uh, the general layout and uh, structure of a scene based on the text description, even uh, not at the pixel level. So, uh, how, so, but AI, how can AI models uh, can learn such kind of uh, visual priors? So nowadays the uh, language models are quite popular and powerful. So they can uh, understand the common sense of the world 
So can the like uh, LLMs to uh, learn and model this visual uh, prior information. So most, more specifically, we would like to uh, explore how these models can be trained to generate the visual uh, storyboard from the text description. So actually we uh, tackle this problem uh, in a numerous paper called uh, Visual GPT. Uh, so the visual prior information uh, involve aspects like, for example, the object location and typically represented by the bounding box and also object shape, uh, which can be represented by the semantic mask or the skeleton key points for the humans. And uh, uh, we need to uh, encode this uh, kind of visual information to the prompt that can be understood by the language model. So uh, we need to design the uh, specific prompt that uh, guide the language model to generate the, the uh, for example, the race of the image content, specifically in, uh, for example, in this prompt, we define uh, several categories such as annotation type, uh, which uh, specify whether we want the language model to generate uh, bounding box locations, or uh, key points, or the masks. And uh, here is a detailed example. Uh, we can have a prompt like uh, multiple bo boxes, uh, instance of the uh, 14 persons and uh, so on. And this prompt tells the LLM to generate bounding box with for multiple uh, small instance. So what we want as the output of uh, the LLM to image and or generate uh, is the, the location or the coordinates of uh, all these 14 objects. So by providing the structured prompt, the area can output the detailed po uh, position and relationship of the object. So this enables us to create a more uh, complete and accurate visual representation based on the simple text description. And here's an example to generate human key, po key points. So in this way, we can uh, discretize the up to the visual world uh, into a sequence token, and we can change the error error to only sequence using uh, next token prediction uh, objective. So here is a demonstration of model. So once the model has been trained on such visual world, uh, data set, it can be used for inference. For example, we can uh, specify a prompt like uh, box multiple instance, uh, for example, and also cups on the dining tables, and let the model compute the risk of the sentence. So this is how the uh, layout looks. So based on the, this layout, we can use the pre-trained layout to image model uh, to generate the final uh, images. And of course, we want to extend this further, especially for video generation. So an interesting uh, approach is called Video Director GPT. So this method is uh, similar in the first step using a model like GTP4 as the planner to create storyboard. So for the video generation, it's not just about a single single layout. Instead, it involves a sequence of layout images. Specifically, the design uh, includes different scenes. Uh, for example, scene one, scene two, scene three, and so on. So with, within each scene, there is a scene description uh, text and uh, a sequence of the uh, friends. For each friend, the, the area is used to uh, generate the object and their coordinate uh, co corresponding locations. So this 
process create a detailed storyboard that guides the generation of video. So given the storyboard, we can use layout to image generative models to create uh, the actual video. Of course, uh, there are challenges to address in this process, such as to uh, ensure the consistency of the sound object across different frames. So here is an example of the video generated by this model uh, using a storyboard as condition. So you can see the description for the scene one, scene two, and so on. And this approach works uh, quite well. So this uh, demonstrate that the storyboard can be used to guide the generation of the coherent and the structured videos. And the uh, video director GPT like directly use the LLM to generate test description and layout. Uh, they use the method of in context learning, uh, which is great, but uh, there are some sometimes the object bounding box and the human key point can be uh, more reasonably generated. So therefore, uh, this paper called Learning Long Form Video Prior by Generative Pre-Training uh, continue with the visual prior to then a better uh, long form video, video prior as object position, human actions, and their significant uh, vari variations across friends through the area and uh, such as such to perform generative pre-training. So they propose a data set which inform modeling long for uh, video prior, such as uh, how objects position and size change over time. Uh, actions and uh, human object interactions. So uh, there are also many exciting work in the domain of storyboarding, uh, which, uh, which is also very great. And uh, for this part, we uh, look into the long video generation. So uh, one model we would like to talk about is the Miwa Excel model from the Microsoft. So the idea behind this model is uh, like a diffusion over diffusion architecture. So focus on the hierarchy generation. So here are some highlights. So for the long video training, it trends on very long video, which more than like 3K friends and uh, the second one is the parallel inference. So the model allows parallel inference, which significantly speed up the generation process and also high resolution uh, data set. They build a high quality data set uh, with a resolution around 1K by 1K pixels and uh, containing 166 episodes. And uh, Let's talk about okay, let's talk more about the this kind of diffusion over diffusion idea. So for generating long video, it's important to have like uh content or conditions to guide the process. So in this case, uh they they use a sequence of the sentence or paragraph, which uh, each sentence describes a short description. So the architecture involves two components, like the first one is global diffusion models. And these models uh, takes the text and uh, uh, generate the very sparse keyframes, which uh, serve as the main uh, content for uh, different scenes or, or shots. And also the local diffusion model. This model uh, is used to fill in the gaps between the keyframes. So by combining these models, they can generate more friends and ensure continuity in a video. And uh, yeah, that's, and uh, in terms of the model design, they aim to have the uh, global and local diffusion models uh, under the same uh, underlying con 
uh, architectures. So the diff key difference lies in the uh, improved conditions for the uh, global diffusion models. They mask everything. So it generates a key difference based on the uh, only on the text prompt without any uh, additional friendly information. So also, and, uh, and for the local diffusion model, this model actually handles the interpolation task. So they provide the first and the last frame of the sequence and masking uh, the frames in between. And here are some examples generated by these models. Uh, starting from very beginning, you can see that the uh, progression through the five millions or, and then uh, onwards to the uh, like 10 million videos. And this demonstrates the model's capability to generate long video effectively. And uh, also other works that in the field of long video generations. And uh, the last piece that I want to talk about in the video generation part is the concept of uh, multimodal guided generation. So uh, with multimodal guided essentially involves uh, using multiple signals as condition to guide the video generation process. So far we've seen that condition as text or image and uh, where an image for, for, for example, for the image to video generation task. So the image is animated using uh, text as additional condition. So this approach is uh, somewhat limited in terms of uh, the variety of the condition they use. So in this topic, we are going to explore um, more works in the, in the video generation guided by different uh, modalities. So there's been a lot of work uh, focusing on these areas. So the first one, is, uh, the first one is uh, so-called MCD, motion conditioned diffusion. So this model uses motion to guide the video generation. So the idea is to provide a starting frame and then allows users uh, to draw the arrow to indicate the movement of in the, in the next frames. And uh, the input, the input uh, image is very sparse. Uh, simply uh, indicating the di direction of the specific point. And if the conditions are different, uh, the generative video will of course be different. So to achieve this, the N MCD employs the uh, uh, two-stage generation process. So uh, given the improved uh, directions, uh, for example, sparse strokes, and the model first uh, complete the flow by computing the optical flow. So since the input strokes are uh, quite sparse, this step involves creating a more uh, detailed flow image. And uh, the second part is the diffusion model. The diffusion model is uh, then takes the uh, completed flow as uh, a condition. So along with the, uh, this starting friends to uh, generate the next friend. So by using these two stage models and uh, the MCD uh, can generate uh, videos that follow user providing motion directions. And here are more example of the video generated by these models. And uh, also, there are uh, video generation models that can guide it by uh, uh, another kind of user-specific motions. Uh, for example, the motion control paper, uh, they can handle the uh, not only the object uh, trajectory, but also the uh, camera pose. So the idea is that uh, they extend the unit structure with a camera motion control module and uh, also object motion control module. So uh, the camera control motion module encodes the uh, sequence of uh, 
a sequence, uh, a post sequence, so called RT, uh, and uh, uh, with the they they are injected into the uh, temporal transformers by uh, appending the RT to the input of the uh, second self attention module, and uh, they apply a lightweight. Uh, fully connected layers to interact the camera pose uh, feature and uh, for the subsequent processing. And uh, they handle the object trajectory in a different way, like using a, a additional adapter to encode the trajectory information. And uh, here are some results of the motion control, which is capable of uh, generated uh, video with specific uh, trajectories, uh, uh, either on the uh, object or the camera pose. And also a similar work called camera control, uh, which uh, also take the camera pose as condition and to generate corresponding videos. And uh, one different part is that they encode uh, this kind of uh, camera pose using a six dimension prank embedding and uh, also uh, different from the uh, motion control paper. They are not relying on the numerical values, uh, but but with a uh, more precise and specific design motion control. And here are results of the video condition on the uh, motions. And also we have the other modality that can be used uh, is the sound. So in this work, they use a text prompt together with a audio segment uh, as condition for it video generation. For example, the text prompt uh, might be a photo of, uh, for example, a beautiful beach with a blue sky. So based on this uh, prompt alone, the generated video might not, uh, might show a typical uh, beach scene. However, uh, to make it more precise, an audio segment added uh, as an additional condition, for, for instance, the video might start uh, with the sound of the wave, and uh, then, for example, transit to uh, the sound of the fireplace here. So the additional audio information uh, helps to refine the guided visual content, so make the video more accurately uh, relevant. And here are some work uses audio or sounds as condition for video generation. And another category is image guided video generation. And uh, since we have been uh, touched on this in previous subtopics when discussing how to make an image move. So uh, there are uh, quite a lot of works there working on this kind of uh, image to video generation task. And uh, another very interesting approach uh, uses the brain MRI signals as a condition. So in this work, participants uh, watch a video while their brain activity is recorded using the M MRI machine. So the task is to use the brain signals as a condition to generate the reconstruction uh, re or reconstruct the video that the person was watching. Here are some results from their study. Uh, so on the left, you can see the uh, video that uh, the participants watch. And on the right, the video generated from the brand MRI signals. So where the appearance difference, the, action, the actions are quite uh, consistent and similar. And there's a lot of exciting words in the field of multimodal generation, but due to time limit, we can't cover them uh, all. So, but I really recommend you to watch this uh, 
to to read these works, excellent works. And so let's do a quick summary of the uh, video generation path. So for video generation, we start with uh, some of the pioneer works like VDM and uh, various or uh, various video diffusion models uh, from different companies. And we also discuss the open source models and also the closed source model. And uh, we have explored the categories that focus on training efficient uh, technologies such as uh, animate, uh, animative model and also training free approaches, text to video zero. And uh, when considering more complex scenarios like uh, generating movie lens or long video, uh, we cover this topic like using the story for, for long video generation and also other, uh, for example, diffusion over diffusion model, diffusion over diffusion methods for the long video creation. And additionally, we discuss uh, how to combine different modality for video generation and include sounds, motion, and even MI data. And uh, let's have a short break of like 10 minutes and uh, we continue on the uh, video editing part. Is it possible to share the slide? Or... Yeah, of course, we will share the slide as well as the recording. As well as the recording. Oh, are you going to post it on the website? Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. How long is it? Try to make it faster, like 14 or 15 minutes. Okay. I don't know if we have to extend. Yeah. Do you is this? Okay. No, I just want to see. So this is a lot in video editing. Is there something that you think you can, yeah, so I can start it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so right now it's, it's 345. Maybe we start earlier and also skip some time. Okay. Yeah. If you can, like, if I can start at like four to five or something, do you think I can do it? Uh, maybe, uh, when do you need to see? Uh, Great tutorial. Sorry, I have a quick question. Will we get the presentation on the website? Yeah, yeah, we yeah, yeah. For last year? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we will put the ones for this year? Yeah, yeah. of course. Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. And also great the work. slide will be shared. Sorry? <laughs> the slide will be shared. Okay, yeah. great, great. Thank you, thank you. Because for you, I mean, just like to be honest, like if you want to cover all of this, then it can be done in the same slide. No. Yeah. Should we skip video editing? I can start evaluation. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's do that. Okay. Are you okay with that? Yeah, okay. Because this is, I think. It's... Yeah, maybe you can go with the evaluation first. And if uh, someone wants to stay after five, we can talk about video editing. Okay. Sounds good. Are you okay with this? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about it. No, I can't show. I just because I, I mean, looking at the previous slides, and I think video editing is like close to eight slides, and I don't think we can squeeze it in ten minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So let me. So, I'll, I'll go with the evaluation. Yeah, yeah. Go with the evaluation. And like once I'm done, we can ask if we can. Okay. I, I just um, just stop the room. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm curious if you're aware of any um, research that would generate video directly in the compressor mode. You know, like, mm -hmm. 
AV1 or H64 correctly instead of addition frames and then compression frames? Uh, if I understood correctly, you mean that generate like a longer video in a single batch? Yeah. Um, no. You know, like so with video codecs usually like import like optical flaws and kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So when you take a full, you know, frames, you can press them. Mm -hmm. So you get like a stream of this move there, this move there, this move mm -hmm. there, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that amount of data is like significantly less than the frames. So I'm curious if there's any research that just generates that compressed video directly. Yeah, there are works that compress the videos in the temporal dimension. Okay. Uh, for example, like uh for example if the video is different they can uh downsample it like by eight times mm -hmm. just like what i did in the spatial uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 for example such as the world and uh, those transformer base and even the sora actually is running the temporal compression as well Sure, the topic sounds very interesting and uh, like a realistic problem in the AI, AI classes. So, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Okay. Mm. That's a question. If you have time, I think I yeah. yeah, we can chat later about it. Um, so, so, where are you uh, so we will upload the slide to the website. Yeah, 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 of course. And also the recording. So do you mean the auto regressive generation? This is actually like my computer training is all there. Yeah. Yeah. Try to the but not frame, but specific to say you essentially have to ask and you get all the 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is five years to introduce the video of us, like for previous as a condition, right? So there are works that using like uh, the, the embedding of the previous form as a condition to generate the current day. So yeah, it's doable. Yeah, but I just <laughs> risk it as why the people do not have that so obvious kind of limitation or whatever. It's just a very simple manifestation that you have like previously you have like temporal transport mm -hmm. and uh, instead of temporal transport instead of like uh, entire mask, you just uh, do this uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some mask and that's it and yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. yeah, that's a simple way to do this. But I think, uh, for example, the, the more feasible way is like, uh, have a, like a, a photo and folder, then my encode the previous video second, segment instead of encoding just the last thing. So they might provide a better context, like, like the yeah. of the previous meeting and also previous the previous meeting. Yeah, it's more straightforward in comparison to like content, uh, committing on the previous content. Uh, for the future models, yeah, it's a bit Hey everyone, um, my name is uh, Deekri and uh, I work at Runway and uh, I'm also an assistant professor in the computer science department um, in Boston University. So the third part of the stack is going to focus on uh, evaluation uh, of video generative models. Jay has done like a phenomenal job in the last two hours talking about uh, just setting the stage of um, uh, the foundational models, the basic concepts. Uh, the focus uh, in the next one hour is going to exclusively be on like, how do you evaluate uh, and benchmark against um, all the competing models that keep uh, coming up every day. Um, so let's zoom out, um, out of this um, generative uh, modeling uh, splash and uh, think through uh, the, the basic 
framework that we typically use for evaluating uh, any machine learning model. So uh, we usually start with a task. Let's say it's a classification task. We want to give it an image. We want to identify if there is a cat present in it or not. Um, so we start curating uh, images, label them, uh, and uh, pick the metrics that make most sense to us. Again, if it's a classification task, then um, accuracy uh, or precision makes a lot of sense. Um, and then we compare uh, my awesome method that I've just cooked up with all of the other uh, boring uh, models that are out there. So that's the that's the typical pipeline of, of evaluating a given model. So this framework makes makes a lot of sense if uh, for discriminative tasks. So the example uh, that I was talking about, which is a classification, or um, localization or detection, like putting a box around cats and dogs, or maybe segmenting out where the, the, uh, the pixels that have cats. So for all of these discriminative uh, tasks, this uh, evaluation framework makes, uh, makes perfect sense. Uh, there are uh, uh, widely uh, adopted and accepted uh, data sets, such as MS Coco, ImageNet, Kinetics, um, Ego4D, um, there are metrics that are defined uh, and thoroughly vetted. Uh, and again, like there is this framework in place for you to compare like your uh, awesome fancy method with um, all of the other models that keep coming up. Now let's understand what um, what we're doing uh, in, in, in the case of uh, generative modeling. Um, so as, as Jay already mentioned, we have, um, we, um, take like, tons and tons of training data, images or videos, uh, we train a model, and the task here for the model is to generate novel images or videos that it has not seen before. So given this, what should be the uh, axes that we evaluate this model on? Um, one way to think about it is um, there is this training data distribution and generated data distribution. Which of these two distribution looks better could be one question that we may ask. But again, better is, is, is a very vague term. Um, so one way to ground this is, um, which has been done in the literature, is they've um, tried to quantify what better is along three aspects. One is uh, the visual quality of the generations. Obviously, we want uh, to build a generative model that generates um, realistic, uh, photorealistic images of, of exceptionally high. I think the size aspect now we should have oh, to, sorry. Don't have to issue. So. Oh, I see. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so there have been three uh, different axes. One is, um, are the generations that our model is producing, are they of high visual quality? Um, are they photorealistic? And the third aspect is, how faithful are these uh, generations to the, uh, to the input prompt uh, that I've provided? Um, so with that understanding or background of like what question we are trying to uh, address, um, let's try to fit that into this, this framework of evaluating uh, machine learning models. So we need two things. We need curated data sets. We need metrics. These two will help us compare model one with model uh, two. Unfortunately, there aren't any curated test data sets. This is because of the fundamental nature of the task, because this is generative in nature. So there isn't a, a curated um, labeled data set um, that, that could be leveraged here. What exists though are curated prompt collections. Um, but uh, I'll talk about this in the next few slides and I'll show that um, uh, ideally, um, like any new model that comes out should compare uh, against the same set of prompts to be able to understand uh, the failure modes of different models, but that's not the current status um, in, in the literature. So the second uh, uh, set is uh, metrics. Um, there are three very popular metrics uh, that are accept, uh, that are widely uh, used. Uh, it's inception score, FVD, and clip score. 
I'll, I'll talk about these three uh, in detail. Um, talk about the motivation and uh, how, um, like any, any potential issues uh, that they have. Um, but the most widely adopted way of evaluating model one versus model two has been um, through subjective studies. So most papers report user studies comparing, uh, presenting users with generations from model one and model two, and a preference rate is provided as to like what um, generations or what uh, model generations users tend to prefer uh, the most. Now that sounds great on paper, but qualitative um, uh, studies are extremely time consuming and laborious. Uh, and it's also very hard to reproduce what the, the task setup was in paper one for us to uh, replicate and reproduce and compare with with the, with the current model that, that is being um, uh, that is being designed and there are also issues with uh, quantitative metrics I'll talk about that in the next few slides so um so with that uh, 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 background and like setting the stage let's jump to the the first module which is curated uh, prompt uh, data sets um, one of the first um, uh, prompt collection um, uh, is called Party Prompts. It is a rich collection of around uh, 1,600 prompts, um, all of them in English. Um, the goal of putting together this collection was to be able to understand models' uh, capabilities along different categories. So you would see um, these prompts capturing uh, different um, categories, such as animals or world knowledge or people. They also tend to um, uh, capture different challenging aspects, uh, such as uh, final grain details, spatial relations, counting, all of the um, issues that these models are known uh, to struggle uh, or to fail. Drawbench is another uh, similar collection. Again, like the, the motivation here is to put together a challenging uh, collection of, uh, uh, of prompts uh, to probe any uh, new model uh, and understand how good they are on certain challenging uh, aspects. Now, these are great collections. Um, we have two key issues. Uh, one is that these are for image generative models, not uh, for videos. And these are not as widely adopted um, as we would want them to uh, in the literature. So there are, um, again, like every new uh, paper or any new article comes up with its own collection of prompts that uh, they use to compare this uh, their model with uh, any previous um, uh, model. A very recent um, addition uh, to this um, to this group of prompt collection data sets is um, uh, was uh, released recently by Eval Crafter. Um, so this uh, the good news is this uh, is a collection of seven hundred uh, prompts for uh, the task of video uh, generation. So the uh, uh, authors started with uh, a, a real world um, prompts that they uh, scraped from our discard um, of different um, uh, generation tools. And then um, they cleaned up those prompts, uh, extracted different attribute information, and um, uh, again, like ensured that th these 700 prompts capture different camera motions different artistic styles um, and different scene types and different objects. Um, so again, like strongly advocate for like everyone to adopt uh, such uh, benchmarks that are out there uh, for comparing uh, um, any uh, new models. So that's a very short, uh, quick summary on uh, the existing uh, curated prompts. Um, a big chunk of the stock will focus on, on metrics. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, like we have quantitative and qualitative metrics. So we'll start with um, quantitative uh, metrics. So taking a step back, these are all, this, this is plus just by far like not um, um, exhaustive at all, but this uh, is um, a sample of some of the most popular uh, video generative models that uh, uh, were released just in the last one year. Um, I want to convey two key points here. One is that you would see um, that despite this being a very active and very busy research area, every article or every uh, paper seems to have um, 
a different set of metrics that they that, that they're evaluating their model against. So that's uh, the not so nice part. But the the nice part is that there is there is um, a common denominator here. There are a set of like three metrics that keep coming up in most of these um, articles, and those are um, the inception score and a PD score and a clip score. So. Um, in the next few slides, we'll, we'll understand these three uh, metrics uh, more closely. Any questions at this point? Awesome. Um, so inception score um, was something that was proposed um, in 2016. Um, and it's important to keep the context in mind that this was proposed in, um, in an era where GANs were getting popular. Um, so um, uh, the, the context becomes clear as we break down how inception score is defined. Um, so it's it's uh, based on two key assumptions. The first assumption is that um, we are evaluating a sample of generated models um, uh, where the model is trained on labeled data sets. So that's the first uh, assumption. The second assumption is that we have um, a, a classifier uh, 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 that given an image X can predict uh, a label Y on this labeled data set. So we have a classifier that is trained on this labeled data set. So that's uh, assumption two. So given uh, this assumptions, uh, the goal is to um, have the generations satisfy two criteria. One is sharpness and diversity. Um, as a running example, let's look at um, MNIST dataset. It's a collection of um, um, images with digits uh, running through zero to nine. Um, if an image is sharp, then um, it becomes easy for a classifier to predict uh, uh, the digit in that particular image. So the classifier would have a higher confidence in detecting, uh, in classifying that image. So higher sharpness implies higher uh, prediction probability for the classifier, which means um, a peaky probability distribution along that particular class, which in turn means lower entropy in the probability distribution. So that's exactly what is being modeled here. So you, uh, this metric tries to optimize um, for highly sharp images, which means probability distributions, which have low entropy. So that's sharpness. There is a way to achieve um, sharper images by um, when you hit um, what is called as a mode collapse, where you tend to always predict only one particular category. So to avoid this, the authors introduced a second term called uh, diversity. The goal again here is that you, again, grounding it with, uh, uh, with MNIST, you'd want to be able to predict all 10 digits and not just a particular uh, digit. Um, so if you want to do that, then the, the class the probability distribution of uh, the class classes P of C should be more spread out and shouldn't peak at one particular uh, class. So that means that um, the, the distribution of P of C should have um, very high entropy. So inception score is, is a combination of these two, um, these two terms. You want um, your generations to be sharper and you want uh, your generations to have more diverse content. Um, the score is a simple multiplication of these two terms. Um, higher inception score implies that um, the generations are of better quality. Again, um, these this metric was defined um, in 2016 in the GANs era where uh, the generations were very blurry and mode collapse was like a, 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 an issue that uh, that was very uh, prevalent. So in order to be able to um, accurately measure uh, if a, uh, measure against these issues, uh, inception score was very valuable at that time. There is a nice article uh, by Shane and, and uh, co-authors uh, where um, they, um, 
did a deeper dive into uh, all the issues, potential issues of inception score. Something that um, that was found was um, that the um, this particular score is not robust to different model weight initializations. Um, so something that was presented in their work was, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, you take the same inception um, model, but <clears throat> Uh, the weights are randomly initialized uh, uh, in, in different ways because one of the implementation is from um, PyTosh, the other is from uh, Keras. Um, so this should not affect the classification uh, accuracy and it does not, as you can see in, in, the, in the bottom row uh, highlighted in green. But the authors found that this does, this um, random weight initialization does impact the inception score that gets computed. The other big assumption um, in this uh, in, in uh, with inception score is that you're assuming that you have um, you have a classifier that is trained on the same uh, data uh, that your uh, generative model is trained on. Um, this is often not the case, especially with models being becoming increasingly uh, larger and being trained on uh, millions and billions of images and videos. Uh, what's typically done uh, for the purpose of evaluation is that this um, a, a particular model is pre-trained, but it's fine-tuned on a smaller data set, say CFAR10. Um, and then uh, the inception model is trained on ImageNet. Uh, and this is a setting that's typically used uh, to compute inception score. Um, even though there is a class label overlap between CFAR10 and uh, ImageNet, these are fundamentally two different class distributions. So um, the inception scores are not often reliable. Another issue that um, uh, the authors have found uh, is that there are there is a body of work that tries to use um, inception score either directly um, uh, or indirectly. So directly as in adding it as an additional um, uh, optimization term or indirectly um, as in just using it for cross-validation. Um, they uh, show in their work that it is possible uh, to cheat the system and ha have, uh, have images which have a very high inception score, but they practically look like uh, nice. So in summary, uh, inception score um, made sense in the GAN era, not so much now. It's quick and easy to compute. Um, but it's a frame-based metric. Um, it's brittle uh, to model weight initializations. And it assumes that you have a classifier that is trained on the exact same data distribution as your generated model. Something that um, Inception Score doesn't capture is um, how close the feature distributions are between um, uh, the real uh, data and the generated data. And that is something that's captured by um, uh, FID uh, score. So it essentially um, extracts uh, features uh, from the real, um, uh, the training data that was used to train the model and uh, extracts features using uh, inception uh, network on the generated data and computes uh, a distance between these two distributions. And a lower distance implies that these feature distributions are closer together. Uh, this, again, uh, was introduced uh, during the GAN era, and this was uh, a proxy for how photorealistic the, the generated data distribution is, or how close this distribution is to the real-world data. Um, FVD is an extension uh, of FID. So FID is an image-based metric, and FVD is an extension uh, where um, the, we use a, a video model, which is uh, an inflated 3D component, um, instead of a 2D uh, continent. Um, again, FVD score um, is, is fast, it's simple, uh, it's widely adopted, but we found this internally at Runway and um, it's been documented by uh, other researchers as well that uh, it doesn't correlate with human judgment. So having, um, having a low uh, FVD score may not um, lead to videos which are uh, necessarily sharper or, or have like high uh, visual quality. 
Inception 3D is a 3D model, but it doesn't capture long-term temporal consistency. So this metric still doesn't capture issues such as character deformation or temporal consistency. All of these are extremely crucial um, at, at this uh, time and age. So the third popular metric um, that's, that's used uh, widely uh, is CLIP score. Um, so CLIP, again, as um, uh, Jay had introduced, is, is a model that was released a, a few years ago. Um, uh, it's, it's a joint embedding space between uh, images and uh, text. So there is uh, two ways uh, one could leverage this feature space. One is to measure um, frame consistency. So given a generated video, you could compute um, feature similarity between adjacent frames. Uh, and this could be a loose proxy or a weak indicator of temporal consistency, because you'd want uh, consecutive frames to be closer together in, 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 in their feature space. Something that's more uh, commonly used is prompt consistency. Uh, and here, um, the, the setting is you uh, give a text prompt and um, uh, the the context here is we are evaluating text to video models. So you give a text prompt and a video is generated. Uh, and the task is uh, prompt alignment. How aligned or how faithful is the video um, to the uh, provided prompt? So uh, the clip embedding of, of the text prompt is extracted and the embedding uh, clip image embedding of different frames are extracted. And again, like a similarity is computed. More similar uh, implies uh, more align, uh, alignment. Um, this uh, look great in paper. These are widely adopted, but this again is also a frame-based uh, metric. Um, there is a recent work by Hugh and colleagues which um, have systematically analyzed uh, clip score. Um, and um, here is a running example to, to uh, set the stage. Um, so let's say the, the text prompt uh, is person sitting on a horse in air or gate in grass, uh, etc. Uh, there are two models, uh, stable diffusion 1.5 and 2.1. Here are the generations. Both look reasonably okay. Let's break down the text prompt um, and look at the first uh, one of the actions uh, in the prompt, which is person sitting on the horse. Um, so that's something that's happening in both images. So that's good. The second action is the horse is in the air. Um, that is not captured in the left in the first image, but is captured in the right image. The third thing is an object gate, which is missing from the left image, but is present in the right image. So given these clear uh, discrepancies, you'd imagine that um, clip is effectively capturing um, uh, that uh, the, there is less alignment in the left image compared to the right. Um, it doesn't. Um, and that's then again, this is not like a cherry picked um, uh, result of a particular image. This is something that um, the authors have uh, systematically um, inspected and documented across like different models and different generations. So to address this, um, they proposed um, a new uh, benchmark called uh, uh, TIFA. So it has two stages. Given um, a text uh, input or a text prompt, um, it is passed through a language model. Uh, and, the, uh, and the task for this language model is to generate uh, question and answer pairs purely by looking at uh, the text, uh, purely based on the information in the, in the, in the text prompt. Now the same um, text input is, um, is provided as input to a text to image model and an image is generated. Now uh, this particular image and the questions generated by the LM model are provided as input to a VQA model. And the task for the VQA model is to generate answers to the questions based on the information uh, that's in, in the image. And um, any mismatches uh, is counted as uh, the prompt, the image not being faithful to the prompt. Um, so this work, um, they've open sourced around 4,000 um, uh, diverse text in, uh, text prompts and uh, several questions um, uh, that, that were probed using a language model. 
So in summary, a uh, clip score, again, also widely used, easy to compute. It's a frame-based metric, uh, does not always reflect uh, the model's faithfulness to, to the provided prompt. So let's get back to the first question that we were asking ourselves. So um, um, the question given to uh, distributions, the real world data distribution and the generated data distribution. Um, the, the question we are asking during evaluation is, which of these two sets are better? And we try to uh, evaluate along three different axes, um, visual quality, realism, and prompt alignment. Um, but are these three aspects enough? What if we are able to generate um, an image or a video which um, which is of exceptionally uh, high visual quality, is very photorealistic, aligns well with the prompt, um, but is extremely unsafe, has, um, has a lot of violence and hate speech in it? What if the image that we generate, again, is like extremely photorealistic, but um, constantly underrepresents a particular like demographic in the society uh, in its generations. Um, what if the content is blatantly copying someone's artistic style um, and yet is like again like photorealistic and aligns with the prompt? So, would we consider such a model also to be a good uh, quality model? So this was a question that was um, that was um, uh, studied by uh, several researchers from Stanford, Microsoft, and CMU, but in the context of uh, text-to-image models. Uh, and they put together a framework called HELP, stands for a Holistic Evaluation of um, uh, Text-to-Image Models. Um, and then in there, they've proposed about 12 different aspects that we should um, evaluate a given generative model on. Just in the interest of time, I've sampled um, only a few of these 12. Uh, we've already talked about uh, alignment, quality, and photorealism. Uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes, I'll quickly go through uh, the rest of the uh, aspects. So we'll start with uh, measuring uh, fairness and uh, bias. Um, a recent research article analyzed uh, a couple of tech popular text-to-image models and reported that when um, these models were prompted um, to generate people uh, holding high-paying jobs, they uh, such as lawyers or doctors or politicians, uh, models primarily generated people um, of lighter skin tone and uh, perceived uh, male. What we're seeing here is the average face uh, of all generations uh, for a given uh, particular uh, profession. On the other hand, when the same set of models were uh, prompted to generate uh, people holding relatively lower paying jobs, um, that's when the generations became, um, let's say, more diverse. There were people of different uh, ethnicities, different um, skin tones, and uh, also more uh, women. And this is uh, jarring. This is um, so again, uh, and also not something that's that's uh, um, th this is very well documented and known in 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 the field that women and people of color are usually uh, underrepresented in the uh, in the generative um, in in the generations of popular text to image and text to uh, video models. What's appalling is that this is worse than reality because. Um, in US, um, I think 39% of the doctors identify themselves as women, but only 7% of the generations from these uh, models um, generated women uh, in them. So this is the stereotypical biases is, uh, is, is the big issue. Um, one solution that seems to be widely um, adopted in the field is uh, to explicitly add uh, specific qualifiers um, in the back end, right before uh, the, uh, the the generations are uh, are done. So enhancing uh, a, a user's prompt uh, and with the hope that the model will generate um, uh, more diverse uh, outputs. It's documented that this is uh, uh, something that was done in DALI 3 and several other works. However, um, I mean, we've seen this uh, when uh, uh, earlier when we were talking about clip score, just having a particular qualifier in, in the prompt doesn't um, ensure uh, that the generation would have that particular uh, attribute in it. And that's exactly what was um, um, studied by Sasha and other uh, researchers at Hugging Face. 
So something that um, we at uh, some of the researchers at Runway have uh, worked on was um, we took a different approach to this particular uh, problem. So we our hypothesis here is that the model has seen too many um, uh, depictions of, let's say, the, the concept that we are talking about is CEO. The model has uh, seen too many depictions of um, uh, people of lighter skin tone and perceived male with this particular concept. So let's switch or let's expand that interpretation by supplying more diverse evidences for that particular concept. So that was the key idea. So we started with a, a prompt template as shown here. Um, and so the, this template had a certain placeholders such as for age group, ethnicity, gender, and profession. Um, so we um, um, inserted different uh, qualifier values to each of these uh, placeholders. Um, so we had around um, 60 different ethnicities and 100 different professions. So we did um, a multi uh, multiplicative combination of these and uh, generated several uh, prompts, um, paraphrased them so that they don't look templatish. And we came up with around uh, 80,000 um, prompts focused on um, diverse professions, uh, diverse ethnicities and, and uh, different gender groups. So we uh, use these prompts and an off-the-shelf text-to-image uh, model and uh, generated a, a, a repository of synthetic images. So this was step one of training. In step two, uh, we fine-tuned um, a given model on this uh, synthetic images. Um, Something that I want to stress and highlight is that this, all of this is happening during training. So during evaluation, we don't apply any uh, prompt modifications or uh, any prompt editing. So that was the, the method. Uh, before I jump into the results, I also want to introduce the metric that's, that's commonly used for fairness evaluation. Um, the way we post um, if a model is being fair or not is um, to understand if a particular subgroup is being um, preferred over the other. So let's consider uh, the running example of uh, skin tone being the subgroup and we have um, three different values to it. Let's say uh, light, uh, lighter skin tone, medium and dark. Our, we adopted a metric that's popular in, uh, in the language processing literature called the spirit impact, which is simply a, a, a ratio of the occurrences of uh, a particular subgroup one over a uh, subgroup two. So let's say uh, X1 is uh, a medium skin tone and um, X2 is lighter skin tone. Um, we want as many occurrences of images of uh, which contain lighter skin tone as uh, of medium or darker skin tone. So that's the, the underlying idea. And if the ratio is, is very skewed, then that means that one subgroup is being preferred over the other. So using this particular metric, um, uh, we compared the, the baseline method with the, uh, the DFT, the diversity fine-tuned um, uh, method that I introduced uh, a couple of slides ago. Uh, and we found that um, we were able to, to um, sort of shift this understanding of the model and be able to generate um, more images of different uh, skin tones. Um, I only show skin tones uh, as an example here, but in, in the paper we've studied um, uh, and reported results around like gender and age and other aspects as well. Here are some visual results. Uh, again, on the left are like generations from like baseline models and on the right are generations from diversity fine tune. Um, you tend to see warmer skin tones appearing on the right and also like more um, um, women and, and people of color. So this again, like, um, is yes. Good that you leveled the representativity, but uh, what about the quality and realism of the groups that are underrepresented in the data sets? Did it perform well? Yeah, that's uh, so. Uh, the question was, um, uh, did this 
um, enhancement of like data and addition of synthetic images, did that compromise photorealism or visual quality? Um, and we did uh, a user study and we reported that in the paper that that wasn't the case. Uh, so a blind study um, uh, was done and people consistently preferred the, the fine-tuned model. Um, and we did this for prompts which do not contain people. So like even uh, random uh, objects and animals as well. So um, but th yeah, that's a great question. And that was our worry as well when we were working on this. Thanks. Yes. So when you fine tune, did you add this to the original data set in fully fine tuned it, or otherwise you would have run into get target? We uh we only I mean we didn't add we fine tuned on this, but like used a lower learning rate and fine did not fine tune the entire backbone just so that the model doesn't forget the previous. When you created the data set, did you already filter it because? The official model could also be running into the same problem that you're trying. They could have ignored the prompt. Uh, so was there a manual filtration of these eighty thousand images happening? Yeah, no. Th um, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we did not do any manual filtering, so it is possible that of the eighty thousand images, even though we explicitly uh, inserted a particular ethnicity or a gender, that may have missed out the uh, the image. But um, um. But there would be like few generations where uh, the model was faithful and that helped. Uh, but th that's a fair question. Okay, so just in, in conclusion, um, uh, the work that I presented and like the previous works, they um, mostly focus on uh, um, image generative models. There isn't a lot on the video uh, generation uh, generative models. Uh, that's mainly because the temporal aspect again uh, introduces a very um, a, a big challenge. Um, I've been advocating for this, and I continue to advocate that um, you need to explore more fundamental solutions rather than relying on um, prompt modifications or even like fine tuning. Uh, something that starts um, right at the pre-training phase, than making this as an afterthought during uh, the later stages. Um, so that concludes the, the fairness uh, aspect of it. So we'll move quickly to uh, toxicity. Uh, toxicity, again, is a very uh, broad topic. Uh, uh, but in the context of um, this stuff, I'll primarily focus on visually inappropriate content, such as images and videos containing um, intense violence, uh, blood, uh, sexually explicit material, hate speech, etc. Um, this... Um, is again like a very challenging topic because on one hand you'd want the users um, of your tool or your model to feel safe but you also want them to feel empowered and uh, you're not um, censoring their creative uh, voices so there is a fine balance in trying to build um, a content moderation system um, in the case of most uh, generative models um, this uh, Pipeline seems to be the, the most common defense strategy. So again, like taking a step back, you'd give um, either an image, text, or a video as an input, um, and a, an image or a video is, uh, is generated as the output. So every um, there is moderation uh, applied at every step of the way, and that's the most common um, defense strategy that most uh, 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 companies adopt at this point. There's like several popular APIs exist, uh, which offer text, image, video, audio uh, moderation services. However, uh, Liu and uh, colleagues have recently um, um, analyzed that um, this um, these tools are not foolproof because it's very easy to, uh, to fool uh, the system by um, replacing a potentially uh, harmful or unsafe word with a similar semantically um, um, similar word, uh, such as blood could be replaced with red liquid and you could still um, uh, tweak the model to generate uh, image which does, uh, which could potentially be uh, disturbing. So there are a few works uh, in the space which are trying to, to tackle this. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of those works is called uh, Safe Diffusion. Um, so as uh, Jay already mentioned, the, the, the fundamental um, for, uh, diffusion process 
uh, has an unconditional uh, noise estimation step and given uh, a particular text prompt, uh, the, uh, the, the estimates are guided towards uh, the text prompt. So safe diffusion starts with having a collection of um, unsafe words or unsafe prompts. So in addition to uh, guiding the un unconditional estimates um, towards a user prompt, it also tries to um, guide them away from the known repository of unsafe videos, uh, unsafe prompts, sorry. So just as an example, um, this is the uh, prompt and this is the image that was generated by a, a, a text to image model. Uh, but by applying safe diffusion where the unsafe words were uh, blood in this particular example, uh, the model was guided away from it and that resulted in, in a different uh, image. Um, again, uh, this brings the question of, uh, do you, the content is safe, sure, but it is misaligned with the prompt that was provided. So again, brings back the question of where do you draw the, the line of, um, uh, of building your uh, moderation system? Another work in the similar spirit by um, um, that was published in ICCD was um, takes um, a model that's already pre-trained. Um, and again, it takes a concept that you want to erase from a particular um, from the particular model. And the um, the concept could be abstract, such as nudity or a particular artistic style, or it could be um, very specific, like an object, uh, such as car in, in the image. So the underlying idea is very is, is similar to what we saw in safe diffusion. You'd want the uh, noise estimates uh, moved away from this particular uh, input prompt. Um, so the results here are um, relatively more faithful to the input prompt, uh, minus the, the nudity, minus the object that was asked to uh, be removed. Um, again, as mentioned earlier, given how tricky um, um, the, uh, getting the balance right between like safety and uh, censorship, um, red teaming is something that's being more widely adopted uh, by uh, model developers. Red teaming is a structured testing effort uh, which is typically driven by the developers of the model. Uh, and the goal here is to adopt adversarial methods and try to break your own model. Um, this sounds great on paper, something that everyone does, but also has uh, um, a couple of issues just because it's in, um, it's in the very early phases. Um, there isn't a unified approach that, that has been accepted uh, and is being adopted. Um, there are papers which uh, propose um, an iterative red teaming effort. So identify issues, fix the model, do red teaming again and fix the model. Uh, while there are some papers which talk about doing this in, in like just one step. Um, it's very task dependent. It depends on what aspect or what task you're trying to red team and um, adversarially attack your model. Um, the results are never disclosed because you're sort of exposing the, the vulnerabilities that you've identified uh, in the model that you've developed. Um, and again, this cannot be exhaustive. Um, there are so many creative ways that people usually come up to, to break, uh, uh, break a model. Here is one such example where um, that was proposed by Wei uh, recently um, on um, the, when the when GPT four and Claude were prompted uh, on like a question, um, it that the response seemed right. Um, it refused to answer it, uh, but a very small tweak was uh, both models uh, were, uh, the authors were able to break uh, the model. Um, so this again is highlights how brittle these models are and how um, hard it is to like exhaustively train uh, these models. So in summary, there's a lot of uh, progress that's been made. This is a uh, this is something that a lot of uh, people are very actively working on. Um, I think this is a very vital aspect uh, in along with like building generative tools. It's very important to make sure that they're not being misused. Um, 
we'll quickly move on to um, originality. So taking a step back, like the, the biggest appeal of generative uh, diffusion models was rooted, um, was because it was able to synthesize completely novel images or videos, uh, something that it has not seen in the training data. Um, so it was one initially observed that, okay, because the data that's being generated is so novel, then uh, maybe we don't even have to worry about privacy and copyright issues. But that's obviously not the case because um, uh, there have been like well-documented uh, 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 papers and articles uh, which talk about like training data leakage and like um, copying like someone's artistic um, uh, artistic work. Uh, so it's very important while we are generating and like building the best models uh, to also focus on uh, promoting user trust. Trust can be defined in many different ways, but in this particular talk, I'm focusing on two specific aspects. One is uh, training data leakage, uh, and the other is uh, content ownership. Um, again, uh, want to make sure that uh, because we are training it on like millions and billions of images and videos, uh, there's no way one can like go through all of these videos and images to see if there is like um, personally identifiable information that's that's being fed. Uh, it is important to study uh, the model for any uh, 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 violation of data privacy. In the same way, it is important for users to assert ownership of the content that they've uh, created, whether it's real or generated, so that it's not being um, um, misattributed and redistributed. A recent work by uh, Nicholas and uh, colleagues have indicated that if, the, if a particular data point is repeated um, 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 frequently in the training data, then that increases the likelihood of the model uh, regenerating the exact same image. So if, here is an example where uh, this particular image was repeated, I think, thousands of times in the training data. And the prompt, uh, the caption associated with this image was um, um, yeah, living in the light of Abraham. And once trained, um, prompted on the on the name of the person, um, it was able to uh, reconstruct uh, almost the exact same image. Um, so they've very thoroughly documented like different issues and like what's the right frequency uh, that seems like dangerous. Um, and one solution that was pro uh, that was. Um, uh, proposed is to again like dedupe your training data uh, just so that you can minimize the chance of um, uh, training data leakage. So that seems feasible-ish for images but not so much for videos can, given the, the temporal um, uh, aspect of it. Um, so moving on to like reducing mis, uh, um, misattribution. There are two popular ways um, the, the field is, is approaching this. One is uh, building classifiers that can uh, distinguish between real um, content and AI-generated content. Again, there are uh, like wealth of um, uh, paid APIs by Hive, uh, Amazon, and like several other companies which are providing this as a service. The second approach that um, the field um, uh, is getting very popular is uh, embedding digital watermarks into the images and videos that are being generated. Um, so uh, Lou and uh, colleagues from uh, Google Research proposed an encoder-decoder framework where um, uh, during training, um, given a video and a particular binary message, uh, both are uh, embedded into this, this feature space. Uh, the decoder is um, trained such that even if the input video is modified um, um, in like in extreme cases such as like frame dropping or cropping or adding compression artifacts, um, the decoder should still be able to extract the added um, uh, message. Um, Synth ID again is another um, um, service that DeepMind um, uh, is is offering, where um, it adds uh, allows you to add digital uh, watermarks to images, videos, or audio. Um, a recent work from uh, Show Lab, uh, which is Ring ID, that was open source just uh, I think 
a couple of days ago, um, uh, which tries to, uh, again, like meet two requirements. One is you want the watermark detection to be robust. So even if the image or the video, uh, in, in this case, it's the image, even if the image um, undergoes several transformations, you're still able to um, retrieve the watermark that is added. Um, and while adding the watermark, ensure that there is minimal perceptual quality loss uh, in, in, the, uh, in the images. All right, we've covered a lot of different metrics. One uh, final thing is on uh, aesthetics. Um, there is a wealth of uh, metrics that exist in the literature that try to measure um, aesthetics, uh, but this uh, is coming from the signal processing world where the, the motivation there was to um, train the best compression algorithm. So that's, most of those have not transferred well uh, to the, the generative uh, space, uh, primarily because aesthetics is, is a very um, subjective and a very personal uh, concept. Something that could be visually appealing to me might not be visually appealing to you. So it's, it's, it's a very, um, um, tricky topic to uh, to build uh, one quantifiable like metric that can help in in um, in solving and predicting the aesthetics. Um, something that um, is gaining popularity in the recent um, um, a couple of years is uh, a Dover score. Um, Dover is um, primarily uh, used to either weed out uh, bad quality uh, images of. Uh, videos in this case uh, in your training data or have like a rough metric of aesthetic score on, on your generated content. So this model uh, provides, um, has has two heads. One uh, provides uh, the technical score. So it gives a sense of whether the video has any video distortions such as compression artifacts like um, noise or blurriness, etc. The second head is um, an aesthetic score again it gives a measure of like uh, color distribution and um, would this be a video that um, you'd like to share on social media for example so it's trained on user preference uh, data uh, the other um, popular uh, method that i've used uh, uh, that i've seen being used in um, generative models is um, is, a, is a perceptual image patch similarity metric again it's as the name says, it's it's a frame-based metric. It was designed for images, uh, but it does a good job at capturing uh, spatial distortions, such as like blur blurriness or noise. So that was a quick tour on um, different aspects of evaluating a particular model and like all the method, all the metrics that are out there. Um, the key takeaways would be. Most of the metrics that are being used um, by, um, by the papers are, um, are frame-based metrics. So they don't necessarily transfer um, uh, well for videos. Um, these metrics are not robust. We've seen how brittle most, some of these metrics are uh, CLIP or Inception Score or FED. Um, most of these metrics are missing aspects such as measurement of temporal consistency or character consistency, all of which are extremely important. Um, uh, for, for measurement. Uh, my biggest gripe, it's the, the me metrics and methods are not unified. Everyone um, uses a metric that makes more sense to them. So that should change. And again, like these metrics hopefully should um, be correlated with human, um, human opinion scores so that um, there is faster ways to evaluate things in a quantified manner rather than doing repeated subjective studies. It's not all bad news. Uh, there is good news that this is a very active area of research. Um, there's a lot of work going on. So maybe next year, this slide may not even make sense. Um, there are a lot of other metrics and other facets that uh, were introduced by HELM, uh, something that I talked about a few slides ago that we didn't cover, um, uh, which are also equally important, like the, the, the latent representations that these models are learning. Um, how good are they in, uh, in doing like visual reasoning or other tasks? How robust are they for any adversarial attacks? Um, again, like 
how efficient are these models? Uh, and again, like getting a sense of like temporal consistency and character consistency. So that was the first two modules, like data sets and uh, metrics. There isn't a lot to talk on like comparison because of the lack of unification in the first two. Um, but I just wanted to maybe like highlight like a recent work that was proposed by Lou um, and other colleagues from um, ByteDance perhaps. Um, so EvalCrafter is probably one of the first benchmarks that's out there. Um, it, uh, it is designed with the motivation to be able to um, evaluate uh, uh, all of the models that, that, that keep coming up. Um, so as mentioned earlier, like the, um, the authors um, um, scraped uh, discard uh, prompts of, um, I think, Full Journey and Pika Lab and like several other discard channels. Uh, they gathered over uh, 6,000 prompts, uh, cleaned them up, post-processed, uh, passed them through GPT, tried to uh, uh, ask a lot of like different questions, and curated 700 uh, prompts out of them, which have different meta types, such as like prompts related to human, prompts related to animals, landscape, etc. Um, have information about style, camera motion. Um, so given this repository, um, they uh, pass these uh, prompts through in all of the models that are publicly available or closed source models and evaluate them against um, the axes uh, shown here, the alignment, assessment, quality, you, and, and temporal consistency. We've covered all of these um, and the uh, eval crafter also uses very similar metrics, um, but it's a nice uh, one-stop place where all of these models are, uh, are evaluated and reported. So here is a, a leaderboard um, screenshot taken two days ago um, on like where every model stands um, uh, against like each individual axis and also like a, a final sum score. So I definitely encourage like checking out this, uh, this paper for more uh, details. So in this, um, in the last uh, 45, uh, 50 minutes, we um, looked at different prompt um, collections. We looked at several aspects in which uh, one should, uh, the generative models should be evaluated. We looked at different metrics and all the issues with these metrics and uh, the need for um, a unified way of evaluating um, these models. So uh, at the risk of repeating myself, the key takeaways are it's very, very important to be very rigorous and consistent in, in, in designing your evaluation strategies. It's very important to have your objective uh, metrics that correlate very well with subjective human opinion scores. And it's also equally important to evaluate along uh, bias, toxicity, safety. Um, um, those are as important as photorealism and like visual quality. Um, that's all I've got. Um, thanks for your time and I'm happy to take any questions or feedback. Will you um, Yeah, I've not personally used it yet, but I, I think, um, um, and I don't know if there is a paper that talks about like any gaps, but I think that's a good um, good metric to use, uh, but I have to look at it more closely. Yeah. 